Um, hello, everybody. Um, uh, we are, thank you. Um, we're delighted and honored to have Alexis here uh, to talk about his love of turtles. Um, he tells me that long before he even thought about becoming an artist, he wanted to be a herpetologist. I didn't know what that meant, maybe some of you did. It's the study of frogs and amphibians. And as an artist, um, he's been depicting the natural world for well over two decades, and um, with wit, originality, and was <laughs> one of the first artists to really explore environmental issues in his work, which combines fantasy, fact, draws on all kinds of sources from um, botanical drawings, science fiction movies, uh, Renaissance motifs, um, and <coughs> he is, um, Alexis is, he, he's even had a major retrospective at the Smithsonian, he's had solo shows in at the Brooklyn Museum, at uh, the Houston Contemporary Arts Museum, um, the parish, the Essex Peabody show that I was lucky enough to go to about six months ago. Um, and he's in uh, a great many public and private collections, including uh, the Whitney, the Guggenheim, the Yale Gallery of Art, um, and so we're, we're very lucky to have him. And um, uh, sort of an interesting sideline on his art is that in, uh, when Ang Lee was making The Life of Pi in 2009, he asked Alexis um, to, to provide some artistic vision for the film because it was mostly going to rely on digital images. Um, I'm told that Alexis did hundreds of sketches and his art inspired a sequence, um, uh, a hallucinatory trip between Pi and a tiger. Um, he can probably tell you more about that. But anyway, it's an interesting sideline. He also, there is um, uh, a book on his work was published in um, 2003 and he has, I'm going to shamelessly plug his new book, uh, the library was just given one of his very first copies uh, of works on paper, which uh, he's going to be talking about at, over at Troutbeck um, in the middle of the month, I think the 19th. Um, what else? <laughs> anyway, but to get to turtles, um, I asked Alexis uh, what got him interested in turtles. And uh, what he said to me was, um, well, if you ever go into a pet shop, why wouldn't you want one? Uh, <laughs> and um, he told me that his mother, when he was about five years old, gave him a fish tank. So I guess that's what got him into a pet store. Because soon after that, um, he had not one, but three terrariums in his bedroom. One was for aquatic turtles. Um, another was for box turtles, and the third one was for tortoises. Um, and he told me that that was a lot of work. I mean, turtles are, are, are kind of known for being messy. And so with feeding and cleaning, it was a lot of responsibility, a lot of work. He um, told me that sports kind of took over when he became a teenager. So I think the terrariums, um, receded, but what didn't receive was his love of turtles. And um, he's now here uh, to tell you to tell you all about that love, which clearly began, um, how old were we there, Alexis? Six. 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 At six. Anyway, we're thrilled to have you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you. Yes, that picture Showed what time can do to one. <laughs> Alas. Uh, let me shamelessly plug this works on paper book that I'm doing with my wife, Dorothy Spears, who's going to interview me. Um, she's a fantastic writer and um, professional and uh, professional interviewer. 
So at Troutbeck, if you're interested, I'm not sure what the protocol is, but look it up. What is the date? The 19th. Oh, it's the 19th. Yeah, it is the 19th. So, Jane, thank you for inspiring this. And I want to say I'm lucky to be here because what a great area. I'd never heard of it before two years ago, I'm embarrassed to say, even though I have friends that live here. I thought it was somewhere up there. I'm a Manhattan kid that longed for nature and natural history and always used that as inspiration for things that I was doing. And it's very true that um, as a kid, I loved turtles and collected turtles. I actually had eight vivariums in my room, and that was just three for turtles, and the rest were frogs. And uh, herpetology is a study of reptiles and amphibians. Just, oh, yeah, yeah, don't forget the reptiles <laughs> or the salamanders. So um, I love turtles. I always have. It's true. And I have a, um, a bumper sticker that says, I break for turtles. We break for turtles. So we love turtles, and we'll do anything we can to help them. So. This is a picture of me from, um, I guess, 53 years ago. So let me do the math. And um, that's an eastern box turtle. Can't tell what uh, sex it is. But um, let's see if we can get this thing to work. OK. So I made this little document here to show you how lucky you are to have 12 species of turtles. There's eight that live in Connecticut proper, and then you have four visitors from the ocean. So you're really, this is just an incredible place to look for turtles. S snapping turtles and eastern panda turtles are probably the, the most ubiquitous. Who's, who's seen a turtle this year? Okay, great. Nice. So some of them are rarer than others. Um, the spotted, the wood, and the bog are particularly hard to find. They live in very wet places that um, aren't they aren't water, they're more like bogs. So um, those are those happen to be my favorites. The, I, th I think it's the ones on the right. You have the wood, the, um, uh, the one in the middle of the bog, and the, um, the spotted turtle on the lower right are really just exquisitely beautiful if you see them in person. These were my Bibles as a kid. I remember drawing from these. Does anyone know these books? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I had these books and many others, and I copied the images and loved them and read them and obsessed over them and wanted to do this um, for a living until I realized there was math involved. <laughs> and then I was like, well, really, I just want to make pictures about them and hear stories about them. So um, Peter Pritchard died this year, um, the, who, who wrote the, the book on the right. And he, he was really a prodigy. He wrote that, I believe, when he was 23 years old. Um, I'd say that this is my first so-called mature painting <laughs> of, that include, or painting or drawing that had water, uh, had, had turtles. And of course, we all grew up with Eastern painter sliders. If you see them now in, on the Eastern seaboard above the Mason-Dixon line, they're really escapees from the pet industry. Um, they were the ones that if we had little um, you know, plastic containers with an island and a palm tree. And you know, of course, if you walk down the streets in Chinatown, still they, they're selling them there. And, um, they're really from the, the American South, and they're very, very hardy and very aggressive. Um, they're, they're not as aggressive as snapping turtles, but if you, and I'm jumping ahead a tiny bit, but if you, has anyone been to Central Park to Turtle Pond? If you go over there and you look like you're vaguely interested in what's <laughs> happening in the water, they're gonna come rushing over to you because they think you're gonna feed them. And those are really refugees from the pet trade, people that, um, you know, had kids and they hit puberty and suddenly they wanted to play football or basketball or whatever and they lost interest. Mommy and daddy would secretly take them off and dump them into the pond and somehow they're able to get through the winter because it's a miracle. These, especially the sliders, um, I, can't, I can't understand how they can make it through the winter. One thing that I wanted to just mention was I took my love of natural history and when I went to art school, I bit of a crisis in trying to learn about art history and contemporary art and what am I going to do and blah, 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 and do I have to be an abstract painter? And then I was very lucky that I was born at a time when you could virtually do anything in terms of iconography. And I thought, you can frame what you're doing in terms of being a pop artist. I thought, if Roy Lichtenstein can do cartoons and make a, a life and a career and a living using that as content, why can't I use natural history? And I was very lucky that I was able to do that. So I 
spent my career, which is actually 36 years at this point, making work about our relationship to nature and our perception of it as you know, Western culture and stuff like that, even though I am interested in um, uh, 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 Asian relationships to it as well and Islamic, but I know far less about it. So anyway, I'm getting my career going. I'm making paintings of turtles and frogs and some other things. And much to my amazement, I had a show uh, in the East Village of Jay Gorney, and I was on the cover of Arts Magazine, which was one of the big magazines at the time, and now is defunct, um, unfortunately. But that was a huge vote of confidence that you know, some, I had a friend who said, wow, I thought it looked like Arts Magazine was turning into Field and Stream. Um, it was a sort of backhanded you know, uh, uh, insult, but I, I, I understood where he was coming from. And I like sort of sneaking that type of iconography into, so that's my painting on the left and how it looked on the cover. Um, they cropped it a little bit and washed it out. So I'm going along and I'm, you know, investigating. I'm starting to learn about watercolor, and this 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 um, this drawing is actually in my works on paper monograph that um, uh, it, you can come come visit Dorothy and I discussing it on the 19th, learning about watercolor and how to make images, and of course I'm making paintings at the same time, and I start to become really interested in the biodiversity crisis, which has basically been ever since humans left Africa, whenever whenever that was, um, you know, one million years ago or something like that. So we're talking about this idea that um, this is a tree that has some of the greatest hits of human-induced extinctions. And this is one of the Galapagos tortoises that, um, uh, I think it's the Fernandita um, Galapagos tortoise. There's a, um, one of those monk seals on the left sort of peeking in. So you can see that this is a detail um, of that painting and uh, it's the, the tortoise is on the left. So I'm starting to investigate ideas about um, how to use uh, natural history's iconography. This is quite a large painting. I ended up showing it in um, Austria, I think at the Bayes Rohrpach, um, and um, it was part of a big body of work that I was doing about um, phylogenetic trees and the history of um, understanding taxonomy from people like Ernst Haeckel and stuff like that before cladistics. You know, that's just the study of genetics. <clears throat> Um, here's pretty much the most ambitious painting that I did up to that point in, in uh, 1992. And I finished it um, when I was 29 and showed it when I was 30. And it's, you know, my birthday's in September and the show opened um, at the end of September. So um, the reason that I'm including this is that there is a turtle, actually from a Charles R. Knight painting, that's an extinct turtle, Archeolon. Um, and of course you can see that um, any, any opportunity I have to sneak a turtle in there, I'm, I want to do it. <laughs> um, then some friends and I, and I'm going to show you some pictures um, about that trip a little later once I started to get into ideas about traveling and expeditions and using um, travel as a resource for um, not only my work but for understanding the tradition of going to places and looking at natural history. Um, this is a beach outside of Georgetown, Guyana, where I was um, uh, with two friends, Mark Dine and Bob Brain, and I'll show you pictures of them a little later. Um, coming, we were coming back from being in, up the Essequibo River for two months, and we had about a week to kill before our flight back to New York, and we decided to go poking around in the dumps and the beaches and whatever. I mean, there's a sort of blurry line between what's, what's nature and what, what's, what's not nature, especially in places like that where they have open, they don't have treated sewage and all the garbage goes down the river and ends up on the beach. So this was actually stuff that I photographed on the beach, and it was one of the more disgusting places in the world, and you can see um, uh, uh, this, this leatherback turtle carcass that um, I, I unfortunately saw. But this idea that, all right, this is the most disgusting place in the world, but what would love this, this place? And I thought, well, let's make the painting from the point of view of a fly. So at one point, this painting was gonna be like compound eyes, like, you know, dozens and dozens of little circles that made up how flies would see, but I decided that humans would have a hard time with that. Uh, a couple of years later, uh, well actually not, not a couple, uh, but about 10 years later, um, and I started to become very interested in climate change in the mid 90s and started making paintings about it, um, and I was very concerned about it. So this is this idea that, you know, this is a, a very sort of pastoral bucolic fantasy of Eastern painted turtles in Washington Square Park when it's flooded. Just going to give a little tour of other things that will sort of clue you into where I'm coming from. This is a uh, painting that I made for 
Prospect 2 in New Orleans about um, 10 years ago that is a battle between endemic plants and animals, not really plants in this case, um, and animals and insects and uh, native animals and insects. And so you can see that on the left, there's a domestic cat, there's a xenopus, which is a clawed frog from Africa, reticulated python from uh, Thailand, um, European wild boar, all these things that are really trying to stake out our landscape as invasives. And you know, anytime you're driving down the road and you go to some wetlands in Connecticut, chances are you're gonna see Phragmites um, and not cattails. And that's a very, it's very hard to understand what's going on unless you, you know, really care about it and pay attention. But those are those tall grasses that have the fuzzy um, uh, flowers at the end. Well, those are from the Middle East and um, they, they came over, I think, at the end of the 19th century and they've been muscling out cattails for um, decades and it's, it's very unfortunate. This painting is now in the New Orleans Museum of Art. So there's the turtle. I'm using every excuse to show work. That's an alligator snapping turtle, which is one of the more unique um, uh, uh, species, which is far larger than the common snapper and far more ornate. And Dorothy and I used to have a pet one named Rufus um, that was getting a little big. Another painting of mine more recently from a, a project that I did about the Great Lakes. It's called the Great Lakes Cycle, and it went to six institutions from um, 2017 to 2019, museums around the Great Lakes. So this is really how the watershed um, uh, that leads to the Great Lakes affects um, uh, uh, the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are, and that's, that's a whole lecture unto itself, but it's the idea that cities and agriculture and all these places where humans are become a gateway and bring all this stuff that's you know pollutants or um, uh, phosphates or all sorts of agricultural items, uh, diseases and stuff like that into these waterways that eventually um, empty into uh, um, the, the five Great Lakes. And there you can see, um, I think that's a Western painting of Pedro, I believe. Um, I think that's a borderline, Eastern and Western sort of meet there. <coughs> um, I also do some uh, pro bono, uh, um, work for uh, things like um, uh, um, local wildlife conservation. I can't remember the name of it, but it's very, um, it's a fantastic um, group of uh, ecologists and biologists um, that really draw attention to, to um, animals and insects that are almost extinct, and it becomes like this sort of cat and mouse game. And since I did this poster, um, unfortunately, the, 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 um, the Galapagos tortoise, which is actually the same tortoise that was in my painting from um, the, the bounty, the, the extinction tree, um, uh, almost two decades, or more than two decades ago, um, uh, they've been found, and I just redid parts of it because there are other candidates, so we're redoing a new poster. Now I'm going to show um, a bunch of watercolors that were in my last project that was at Peabody Essex. Uh, museum Guild Hall in East Hampton. It's going to the Princeton University Art Museum next year and then the Akron Museum in um, North Carolina and it's called Shipwrecks and in this case this is the Sargasso Sea, a mythic place of, uh, of deb debauchery and debacle. Um, and uh, uh, this has more to do with Johnny Quest than actually understanding <laughs> what the, what the uh, Sargasso Sea. There was this mythology that all these boats would get entangled in the seaweed in the middle of the Atlantic this is actually where eels um, are, uh, uh, spawn and end up going, coming into our rivers. So this is the beginning of their um, uh, life cycle. This is Vietnamese sculpture that was lost in a shipwreck and you can see the turtle in the upper right. And then the Lusitania, the World War I um, famous uh, uh, let's just say, uh, interaction between nations. <laughs> and then of course rafting, which to me is one of the fascinating things. And I'm gonna show a couple of images um, in a bit. Uh, where Dorothy and I were just in the Galapagos. It was our last trip before um, we, you know, the lockdown and we ended up moving up here from um, uh, Manhattan. And um, we, I've always been fascinated by how animals like tortoises ended up on these islands. And you know, the pre prevailing theory is that they ended up somehow getting there on a piece of either floating because they have very uh, slow metabolisms and they can take it, or they end up attached to a tree that fell in the ocean and somehow made it 
to the Humboldt Current out there, or whatever. It's just a huge mystery to me. It's fascinating. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about turtles in our history, which is really one of the great joys I have in giving lectures like this, or talks like this. And this is a talk I made exclusively for the library. I didn't have anything like this um, uh, <laughs> together. Um, and uh, what was fascinating to me was looking for interesting images of um, turtles from art history. And in this case, this is, um, uh, and I don't even know who Carlo Porpola is, but he looks like he was definitely, um, he's obviously Italian, but he also looks very Northern European. And it's this idea of looking under every rock, like Otto Marseille's von Schreich and um, others, where they're celebrating things that aren't normally uh, privileged in um, uh, still lifes, the things that are squishy and slimy and all those things that I particularly love. You can see there's a there's a crab and different types of frogs and there's a tortoise on the right so and mushrooms and so on and so forth. Giuseppe Recco, don't know who he is. Anyway, it looks like a Franz Snyder's or something like that, right? So this is obviously like some fisherman's catch, and you can see that there's all sorts of bream and snappers and bass and whatever, and then a cuttlefish on the lower right, maybe a cuttlefish and a squid, and then this sad turtle that somehow um, ended up in this bycatch scenario. So it looks very Neapolitan as far as I'm concerned. And then of course, I have to find something that's not European exclusively. We have this, um, how do you, Diacusho Koyabata, a tortoise from 1890. And I, is that a wig? Is that seaweed? What is that growing on there? I mean, it's kind of fantastic and mysterious, but. Um, it is really uh, so, so, something else. And I, obviously, it's super elegant and, and beautiful and balanced and very zen. Then we have um, Winslow Homer's The Rum K, which is a fame, as far as I'm concerned, Homer's one of the greatest watercolors ever. Um, truly magnificent. And, and it's not going to end well for that turtle, as far as I'm, I'm concerned. It looks like it's laying its eggs and trying to get away. And then, of course, Charles R. Knight, the great paleontological illustrator, who, if you go to the Museum of Natural History and you see paintings of dinosaurs from the 19th and early 20th century before the dinosaur revolution where now they look like they have feathers and all the stuff that I know is true, but I don't want it to be true because I think this looks much cooler. Um, you can see that um, there's, uh, I'm sorry, there's that turtle on the lower right. And if you remember evolution where I showed you that detail, that's exactly where I got this piece of reference. And he's one of my favorite painters and really I think extraordinary in terms of working with scientists and creating these ecosystems that um, I, 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 especially when I was you know, a kid, put, I thought they were incredibly enchanting and fascinating. And um, this also, you can see the influence of artists like Poudre de Chavon and some uh, post-impressionists like Gauguin and people like that as well. And then of course, you have to give a shout out to Ray Harryhausen, the great stop motion animator who had a sequence in the, um, what to say, uneven one million years BC. Um, <laughs> without the animation, it would be unbearable. And um, so in this case, there's a very peculiar sequence because all of a sudden this turtle appears, all the cavemen, whatever that means, have a fight with it and it sort of wanders off into the sea and disappears. I mean, nothing happens really. It just sort of walks by and they sort of try to attack it and unsuccessfully. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, travel and people that inspired me to begin with and then a couple of trips that I've been on with some friends. Um, William Beebe, does anyone know who William Beebe was? Yeah. William Beebe, the great, great, great educator, who was the director of the Bronx Zoo, um, and was a man about town, had his own caricature in the New Yorker, um, died in 1962, and he went on these expeditions to places like the Galapagos, and he would bring an artist, like Isabella Cooper. Mm -hmm. Isabella Cooper is a great illustrator who would go on these trips and draw all the illustrations because it's before color photography or anything like that. So how do you show these trade books, like how fascinating these places are and how wonderful they are and what the biodiversity is like. So you can see that, um, you know, you have marine iguanas and lava crabs and um, uh, some sort of uh, hermit crab, it looks like, or no, maybe it's a barnacle, I can't really tell. Um, and then the biodiversity of these animals that are, you know, obviously originally from the mainland, right? These are new world lizards on the left. And how did they end up looking like that? It's so fascinating. And then of course the fish on the right. So people like Isabella Cooper, and there's a couple of dozen of them that traveled with 
um, uh, expeditions um, uh, around the world have always been a huge inspiration to me. And so is art history, people like Delacroix on the upper left, that's one of his sketchbooks from Morocco. Um, uh, Sargent and some of the earth artists. I mean, all these, all these people are, when I started um, traveling and thinking about my work, these were things that were like in my brain and washing around like a bouillon paste. How was I gonna make a dish out of this stuff? But this is the first trip that I took with um, uh, Mark Dion, great sculptor, anyone know his work? Mm -hmm. A couple people, great. Um, he's the young man in the middle, I'm on the right, and Bob Brain, a great photographer on the left. And we decided we were gonna go to Guyana because A, they spoke English, <laughs> none of us spoke Spanish or Portuguese. Does Guyana, everyone know where Guyana is? Mm -hmm. Okay, because I had to look it up once I was told we were going there. <laughs> um, that's me on the left drawing a catfish that we had caught, drawing the insects that were eating the catfish on the right. Um, and that's the, probably the same day, or it's definitely the same camp. Mark's killing something, I'm drawing something, smoking cigarettes, drinking a lot of coffee. Um, I wasn't drinking alcohol there then, it was terrible, terribly boring during the downtime, but uh, you know, builds character. You can see the hot sauce behind Mark's shoulder on the left. Um, so we went on this, this trip for two months, and then on the way out, we stopped at the beach, and that's where that fly um, leatherback turtle came from. This was my, um, a, my, my desire to sort of get out of being an armchair artist. I wanted to go to these places, like Isabella Cooper, and not under the auspices of, of um, institutional power, because I didn't want to be told what to do. And then I would come back and I would consult the scientists. Actually, Someone who wrote an op-ed today in the Times, Tom Lovejoy, did, did anyone read that about climate change and about how forests are so crucial to our future? Well, go home and read it. Um, Tom Lovejoy, who's um, at, what, at the Heinz Center, or was at the Heinz Center, was one of the people that um, uh, encouraged us to go to Guyana. So um, it, it really became the sort of autodidact version of all these different things that I was fascinated by. A couple years later, I was actually hired by the Museum of Natural History um, to go down to Manaus and look at, this is a painting I made for the cover, it was actually quite big, it's, it's 96 inches wide, um, sort of telling the viewer, and I guess in an illustrational way, whatever that means, um, I, I think there's a hangover of that being a dirty word, but I love illustration, showing the story of what, what's happening with forest fragmentation and habitat loss in, in um, a place like Brazil. And here's another illustration that I did, and there's showing how the forest gets affected by being clear cut and secondary growth and tertiary growth and so on and so forth. So I love doing projects like that, and um, uh, that, that was a great opportunity. Um, this is just one photograph I have from a, a trip that, um, and this is um, uh, one of the only time that we saw a tortoise. I was hired by Discovery Channel to go with a paleontologist and go look at fossils and stuff like that. And we ended up going to the Burgess Shale, the Kuru Desert, which is um, a, a, a great fossil bed for um, uh, mammal-like reptiles um, from the Permian. Um, so uh, that, that, was, that, was, that was the last trip that I took before Dorothy and I went to Antarctica um, together. And that's Dorothy on the left, in case you're wondering. Um, <laughs> we, were so, uh, we were so lucky to be invited by Lindblad Expeditions um, to go on this, this uh, cruise um, down the Antarctic Peninsula and um, you know, go kayaking. And then um, on the way down, this is a watercolor I made based on a photograph that I took. And Dorothy was um, writing for the Times at that point, And she was the Times um, uh, uh, correspondent on the bridge of the ship. And suddenly, everyone on the ship was, uh, was, was, was giving her wide berth um, because she was the person who was giving um, the New York Times the information about this sinking ship that we were witnessing, that we had to go and um, at least investigate and see if they needed rescue. Luckily, another ship came along and rescued them. So when um, this was on the cover of, I think, the week before Thanksgiving, uh, November 23rd or something like that, 2000 and, uh, I think it was 2008, and um, uh, that was your name above the fold. Here's a painting I made from that trip. <clears throat> Here's another uh, work that I made, actually for um, a show at Mass Mocha that um, happened in 2008 as well. That's actually the longest thing I've ever made. It's obviously a series of 
seven um, sheets of paper, but it's uh, I think it's about 35 pages long. This is actually right before, um, uh, this is the last summer before COVID, and I was invited by um, the Turtle Conservancy and um, James Liu and a bunch of other herpetologists to go do a census in New Jersey when Dorothy was in, where were you, in, in uh, Venice, or? Oh, okay. You were somewhere glamorous, and I was there, <laughs> which is glamorous. Well, I was in Greece. You were in Greece. And I had to work on something or something, and. Um, I got the call and I'm like, finally, I get to go with these guys out to look at, look for these turtles, which I'm really excited about. And um, uh, that's a wood turtle, which I'd never seen in the wild. And go figure, New Jersey, who would know, right? Um, one of the places we went was behind a Domino's Pizza somehow. They had a big, big habit there. And here is, um, I think that is a Dynavac Terrapin. This is a turtle, captive turtle um, breeding uh, program that's connected to the Turtle Conservancy. And these are the spotted turtles I was telling you about, which were also being captive bred there and then released into the wild um, shortly thereafter. So um, I'm jumping for joy on the inside, at least. This is from last year. And we would be, you know, walking down. We would go on our walks. And where's that? What's that trail again? That long, straight one? Um, in, um, the, railroad, the old railroad road, actually. Where's that? The railroad? Yeah. yeah, so, you know, you go there in May or June and you see tons of turtles trying to get from one area to another. That's, I think, a snapping turtle on the left, and then there's an uh, eastern painted on the right. And then this is our last trip before COVID. We barely got back um, uh, February 21st, 2020, and, um, and then, uh, well, we know what happened after that. So the last thing I'm going to show you guys is a body of work that have really specifically to do with place. And there are field drawings that actually started in 1994. And it goes something like this. I'd be invited to or go to a place like Antarctica, Tasmania, Fresh Kills Landfill in Staten Island. There's no plan. I'm very democratic. I think I've been to 16 places and I collect organic material and I make drawings using the material on paper about the ecology of that area. So it's a chance for me to have a conversation with local scientists, do research, and for example, this is a drawing that I made with tar from the La Brea Tar Pits um, in 1999 because I happened to be on an expedition in Baja, California with the director of the La Brea Tar Pits in 1998. And I said, can I get a thing of tar on a species list? I want to do a show about what they found in those tar pits. And there were like 3,000 different species, including brook trout and crazy things. So I ended up doing about 100 drawings using this material, which is extremely toxic and very difficult to work with. Um, that's the only turtle I made for, for that project. That's why I'm including that. This is an unfortunate, I seem to have a leatherback turtle thing. This is an unfortunate um, victim of. Uh, probably a fishing net or something like that on, in East Hampton, Townland Beach. Um, has anyone been to that, that, know that beach? I mean, it's a great beach to, to be on, but um, Dorothy got a call from a friend of ours, um, Lucy Winton, who said, there's a leatherback turtle carcass, Alexis, go look at it. Mm -hmm. So grab the dog, that's our dog, Padme, who's now dead, unfortunately. Um, got in the car, drove out there, and it was misty and really beautiful. And all I could see were this flock of seagulls that were hovering over this thing. And as I got closer and closer to it, and I had to really, like, I had the dog on a leash at that point because I didn't want the dog to disrupt whatever was happening because she was raring to go. Um, there were seagulls all over it, eating its eyes and face and stuff. It was really horrible. And then they flew away. And I ended up getting sand um, from underneath this um, un unfortunate individual. And this was the first drawing I made for a show that I did called East End Field Drawings at the Parish um, Art Museum in, I think it's 2016, 15. There's me on another beach. Dorothy took that photo on the left. I think that's Kirk Park Beach, I remember. And there's some of the earlier drawings that I made on the right of salamanders from behind the, um, the North Fork Museum of Natural History. Here are the different sites that I um, visited. That's from the catalog. And there's the leatherback turtle. That was the first one that I made. 
box turtles from the same site where those salamanders were right behind the, the, um, the, the South Fork Museum of Natural History. This is from Kirk Park Beach, I think, yeah. And there's the installation of that project um, in uh, 2015. There's another photograph that Dorothy took on the left. Um, Carl Melling took the photograph on the right. Um, that's me in Riverside Park on the left. I'm somewhere in the, I don't know, somewhere up near the Bronx or something. Um, one of the first things I did on this project with Natural History of New York City, which I showed at Salon 94, which is really inspired by another William Beebe book, which is absolutely wonderful, called Unseen Life in New York. It gives a tour of not only what lives in New York now, but what used to live in New York from the fossil record through the Pleistocene and so on and so forth. So I used that as an inspiration. And um, uh, Jeannie Greenberg and I gave some of the sales from this project to the, um, the Bronx Sioux Wildlife Conservation Society or whatever they call themselves now. I did not take this picture, but I just think it's fantastic. Um, this is just off the internet of an eastern <coughs> painted turtle in Turtle Pond. And it really looks like it owns the place and I guess it kind of does. So I can't remember how many species actually live in the, um, the turtle pond, but I think it's six, if I'm not mistaken, the common musk turtle, which is made out of dirt that I collected on the bank of that pond. The red-eared slider, which I've been talking nonstop about. The yellow-bellied slider, which is from somewhere in the south, I believe. The common snapper, which is, this is a very cute, adorable, small, young one, juvenile. And the eastern painted turtle, which is, of course, I think the hardiest of them all. And here's an installation um, of that project, which included dinosaurs from this fossil record. Who knew that there were, um, there, you could get fossils in Staten Island, in the clay pit preserves there. I was, oh, one other thing I was going to say, the first thing I did was, I called up a friend at the Museum of Natural History, Carl Melling, and I said, Carl, you know, I'm starting this project, and I really want to do the fossil record of New York City, and do you know anyone that knows something about that? And, I, and he said, well, I'm the only person that knows about that. Oh, when, when do you want to go? I said, pick me up tomorrow morning at 7. So we went on a tour to these sites from Staten Island, um, Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, Bruckner Boulevard, northern Manhattan, and then... We snuck in New Jersey to Palisades all in one day, and I'm collecting stuff and throwing it in bags and writing down where it's from and all that stuff. And then I got on the phone with him and said, all right, what would be typical of this area? And I went through a list, and I'd say about 15 of those um, drawings. And you can see, um, on the, if you go on the right side of the wall, um, you can see a, a, it looks like a tyrannosaur on the lower level facing to the right, and then there's a mastodon from Teague Triangle. Um, above that, so that's an example of what I'm talking about. And then this is another shot of that installation with two of the turtles. And that is the last image. I love questions if there are any. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about how you use those materials, the sand and the because it, on the page it looks like pastel or something. So, well, it really depends. The tar is very toxic, and you have to use benzene as a solvent. And I'll never do that again. But you have to have a gessoed surface, or else it will just eat the paper up. Um, I've even done it with wombat poop. Um, you, do you use a brush? No, I do sort of like with an eyedropper, and I make a puddle, and it's just... Very, they're very quick. They're very high risk, high reward. They don't take particularly long. Um, I mix them with um, matte medium, which is an acrylic polymer, just so it doesn't fall off the paper. It's invisible, but it sort of keeps it. It's like Elmer's glue, sort of. So. Um, and the sand? The sand is sand. You just you put it in an eyedropper and you put you draw with it. It's just like in a puddle. So you make a puddle and then you have like an area where you see that whale there. The sand is the dark part. I think, that, I think that's so beautiful that you use the material from the place to capture the spirit of the animal. I mean, I think that's just, it's so interesting. 
Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. It's really been, fa I mean, I tried to do it with squid ink, but I couldn't get in, giant squid ink. I was in um, Melbourne and I had a friend who studies giant squids at the Victoria Museum of Natural History. And um, he, he could give me a piece of eye, but I couldn't get the ink. I got <laughs> sperm whale, sperm I mean, it's gross, right? But, but it's amazing. It's, it's fun. And I'll tell you a funny story. And then I'll go to more questions, but you're, you're going to laugh. Um, so I'm teaching, I won't say where. And I'm teaching field drawing because what kid doesn't want to play with their own poop or whatever, right? So um, <laughs> I, right? So um, I'm teaching this class, and it's really it's a day like today, and we're in the Upper Peninsula, and it's part of the like the the the, the cycle, the, the Great Lakes cycle, and I'm doing education. And I'm happy to do it. And the stu the student comes to me and says, I made a drawing out of Canada geese poop. And it was so disgusting. I was like, that's great, but I ain't going that. I'm not going near that. I mean, that was like over the line. So there's a line, and I found it. I didn't think I would find it. Um, I used my own blood to do leeches from Tasmania. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, yeah. Come to the uh, Troutbeck thing, and you'll hear far more revealing stories, because I'm sort of protecting myself. Dorothy's really going to open the can of worms <laughs> as a professional. I'm going to start with you because you were first here. What's the cross street of Turtle Pond in Central Park? I don't know. I mean, oh, I just so know where it is. End of the park. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Do you still have terrariums? I don't. I, I, um, I find the last terrarium we had were beaded dragons, which are from Australia, which are lizards. Bearded dragons, sorry. Um, thinking of beaded lizards and Rufus the alligator snapping turtle and then the kids lost interest and we were like don't we, I've learned so much about conservation and stuff since the 70s and I I don't really I want them out to, to be out there and happy in their habitat and I want to see them I don't want to have them Good. more yeah what's the difference between a turtle and a tortoise all tortoises are turtles, but not all turtles are tortoises. I mean, it's just a common name vernacular, but it's okay. generally tortoises have a more domed shell, and they are not aquatic. So not aquatic. that's what, yeah. Uh, yeah, you mentioned being up here in May or June and seeing a lot of turtles around. We do see that in particular, you know, we see big snapping turtles crossing the road yeah. in June or so. I always figured that they're females going somewhere to lay their eggs. Am Probably. I right? And also, is there something wrong with my picking them up and putting them in my pond, which I tend to do? <laughs> I mean, well, if you can take the risk. Yeah. <laughs> um, I tend to think it's always the best to take whatever's crossing the road and whatever direction it's pointing and just get it across the road and hope for the best. Um, I, I don't think it'll matter really with snapping turtles are really of least concern in terms of conservation stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, well, we do have one that's been living in our pond for five or six years. Yeah, yeah. Right there. yeah. Hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. I wanted to follow up on this gentleman's comment. Something I discovered this time last week with a snapping turtle. Uh, sir, how did you how did you pick them up? <laughs> My wife helped me. Chopsticks. <laughs> well, how did you do it? No, we, 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 yeah, and a tarpaulin. We put a tarpaulin out and then sort of pushed it with a, uh, a shovel onto the tarpaulin and then we picked up the four corners. How many in this room would pick them up by the tail like I Oh, it's terrible. Oh. Yeah, well, that's what I always heard. So I did because I was like this. Yeah. First, I photographed. It was a back road in Milliton and uh, had blinkers on and off. And it was a beautiful creature going one way. And once I, Stopped and turned around, and I knew he wanted to get back to where he was going. So I did the tail thing, and I reached the cubby, and it almost felt like a chiropractic adjustment. <laughs> and then he turned around a little bit, and his big pink mouth and all. That was beautiful to put him down. And then I told a friend, I said, it's the worst thing you can do. You have a vertebrae right up the back. Absolutely. Then I went to YouTube. You can grab the back of the shell, turn them around, and drag them, or put them on a car mat, anything yeah. but a cold emergency. Yeah, but dragging them on the street hurts their underside, so it's not um, great. Isn't Depends that on... mostly shell? Well, but it's, it's sort of live shell underneath. Yeah. Well, it's not you like did the right thing. <laughs> um, and, and then I'll say, your work is exquisite, inspiring. Um, Thank you. Where do you go from here? 
um, doing a project about the ocean for the Mystic Seaport Museum. All right? So that's what I'm working on today. Uh, spring of 23. It's going to open. Yeah, hopefully. You had, you had a question? We often just take a little branch or a bigger branch, depending on how big the snapper is, put it down there and just wait for a minute, and then usually, most of the time, he grabs onto it, and we just work from across the road that way. That's pretty good. I think good. probably the best is that the YouTube is really a fantastic resource for so many things, like getting the lights to turn on at the right time, or whatever. <laughs> um, I think it's anthropologically to me, like a tarp is probably the best idea, because again, you're putting strain on the yeah. you know, vertebrae and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So they'll, they'll bite the hell out of anything. Your work, they, your work is exquisite. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So I am. Oh, back there. Uh, you've made a number of references to natural history. Did you, on any occasion, study natural history, or just on every occasion, but not in an um, academic context? Even though I have conversations with scientists as much as possible. So yeah. Um, in Kent, a couple of years ago, we, um, the Kent Conservation Commission, purchased a number of turtle crossing signs. And we placed them all around in places where people just knew from their knowledge that the turtles would always be crossing. Unfortunately, the tough times were very pretty and they never lasted very long. They all got <laughs> taken. But I, so I don't think we'll do that again. But my question to you is, do the turtles cross with the same thing like the moon with the, the way the salamanders do? It's a good question. I, I don't know the answer. I better go home. Brooke. What are you predicting, Alexis, with climate change? Um, that's a dire, sad story, um, eventually, but we're in a great place. There's a lot of fresh water and, um, you mean Lakefield County? Yeah. Right. I think this is like a, the type of place that is going to be in better shape than most. But, um, anyway, that's a different conversation, but it's not going to be that pretty. Bummer. Yeah. I just wondered, around here, are the better times of the year when one's more likely to see turtles? As, I think it's in the spring when they're, you know, thinking about getting from one place to another. They're frisky, they're hungry, they're out of hibernation and want to lay eggs and stuff like that. But it's really just look at, in the internet. I'm, I'm not a turtle expert. My love is special, though. <laughs> Don't we all think so? Yes. Um, how many times have you been to the Natural History Museum in Manhattan? Um, a gazillion. <laughs> as, as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you. I had, a, I had a column in Natural History Magazine even for three years. That was the beginning of that. And then the editor got fired. And it was me and Stephen Jay Gould were the only people that had regular columns in that magazine. And I remember we were joking around with him about that before he died, unfortunately. I guess that looks like you're all ready for dinner and cocktail party. <laughs> <laughs>